This is ultimately a story about programming and what you can do with just a little bit of know-how and if we do this right, what maybe a few months hence, a thousand people in this room might be able to accomplish uh, on this campus. So I was a freshman in 1995. I lived in Matthews 201. <laughs> happened, to be, happened to be Matt Damon's room. Uh, completely irrelevant to the story, but always made me feel cool. Um, and I came into this place having always really liked history. I always liked government. I liked constitutional law in high school. And as a freshman, I was one of these completely overzealous, very anal students who really need to figure out his life. And I probably, with that first meeting with my proctor, figured out every single course of the 32 that I was going to take between freshman year and senior year. And I went on this path of government. I was specifically majoring in government because it was kind of what I knew. It was kind of what I thought I liked. And so I went down that path. And I'd always been a bit of a geek, and I'd always had a bit of an interest in computers, but I always looked on my friends in high school who actually took computer science as sort of the geeky friends of mine. And so I shied away from it. And I also shied away from taking any computer science early on in my career here because it was actually very intimidating. This course that I now teach actually had then, and still now to some extent, this reputation of being very intimidating, very scary. This is really only something the elite on campus actually take, and I was scared away. And so I took Gov 10 and Gov 20 and so forth. And it was finally sophomore year when I got up the nerve to actually enroll in this course. But even then, I took it pass fail because I was just just too sort of timid when it came to actually joining the ranks of the students who were in this class. And yet what I found for the first time, as I say in 50's own first lecture, is that this was the first time, and this is not meant to be a cliche or anything like that, that homework was actually fun. I finally found something that, no joke, Friday nights would roll around, and I would look forward to sitting down in my dorm room in Mather and working on my CS50 problem set. And at the time, I was still a Gov major, and I only had a little bit of time left to change my path so that I could actually fit the courses in. And yet I did. And it was this act of taking this course that was sort of off my path. It was not really in my comfort zone that literally has changed my life. And I don't know if I'm allowed to offer two ideas today. But if I am, the one idea that I first stumbled upon sophomore year was that if you have this chance, especially if you're juniors or earlier, to veer off whatever path you are on for just a moment and take that class that you think, oh, I'll take it senior spring when I finally get everything out, else out of the way, like don't. Three of the best classes I ever took here were 50, uh, Anthropology 1010, Introduction to Archaeology, and Dramatic Arts 101, predominantly because these three things were so outside of my comfort zone and so unlike anything I had done. And I mean, my God, I never expected to be doing what I'm actually doing at this moment now on computer science, no less. So let's, get, let's level the playing field for just a moment. So what is programming? Some of you know, but programming is really not so foreign. It's something that most of us in this room could do right now with just a tad bit of guidance. So programming is all about telling a computer what to do. You need to be able to express yourself, but you need to be able to express yourself succinctly and tersely and, and specifically, because computers, though yours own might intimidate you, is actually a pretty dumb device. It can only do what you tell what to do. So if we were to depict what you can tell a computer with these little P, uh, graphics here, you can tell a computer to do something, say something. And so this would represent what we call in programming a statement. You can tell a computer to do something conditionally. If something is true, go off in this direction, else go off in this other direction instead. You can tell a computer, too, to repeat itself multiple times and do something useful again and again. So I thought I'd actually whip out the little program that we use to, that I use to make these actual puzzle pieces here, uh, the folks down at the road at MIT made this language. It's called Scratch. It's one of the many ways in which you can express yourself to a computer succinctly. And you do this by dragging and dropping little puzzle pieces that represent the fundamental building blocks of programming. This one here says, when green flag clicked. So that says, when you click this green flag somewhere in this program, do the following. Well, what do you actually want this thing to do? Well, let me go ahead and just do something like play a sound. And let me go ahead and assuming the house audio is up, if I click this green flag, Okay. All right, so adorable, but not all that useful and really nothing to brag about. But what if we got a little more interesting and added some more of these logical constructs? You know what? Let's actually do the following forever. Play that sound forever, and then, you know, go ahead and just wait a couple seconds after each such iteration. So now we've got... 
All right, cute, but not all that impressive. Let me go ahead and take out a couple of that I prefabbed here. This one here, that's actually a little more dynamic. So same idea, dragging and dropping puzzle pieces. But notice this time I deployed this thing we'll call a condition, a branch. If apparently I'm touching the mouse pointer, then only should you play this sound. And so if I actually hit the green flag here and hit play, well, now only if I'm touching this thing. So now this is my little petting the cat example. Well, finally, if we take things up a notch further with this third version, notice I've introduced that idea of a loop and a condition. And this one I'll let uh, speak for itself. Hitting the green flag. It's doing its thing every two seconds, but better not touch the cat. <laughs> All right. Better even louder. So this is one language, but the languages a typical person would express him or himself or herself in these days are a little more uh, keyboard oriented. So what you just saw pictorially like this might in an actual computer program in a language like C or Java or PHP, just a little something like this that you can actually type on your keyboard. Something that looked like this a moment ago looks the same with if parentheses and else. Something that looked like this looks a little more cryptic still but it's still just a translation to those same ideas, ifs and elses and conditions to the printed keyboard. And in fact, if I wanted to whip up a very quick program, this is just a stupid little text editor like text edit or notepad, I can do a little something like this. So uh, some of this is just sort of necessary setup. So you can sort of ignore the first part of this program here. But now if I actually want to tell this computer to do something, it's as simple as printing Hello, Sanders. Close that. And actually, if we want to do this again and again, true is always true. So why don't we go ahead and do this ad nauseum. I'm going to take the English-like syntax I just typed. I'm going to run it through a special program that happens to be called a compiler that will, do, uh, that will convert my pseudo English into zeros and ones. And what you get is a little something stupid like this. Well, if you have some foresight and you put a little cleverness into it, these I prefab for you. So it's Valentine's Day coming up. I thought I'd prefab you a little Valentine. Hope you appreciate this work of art. Oh, you do. Now, for, for some of you who are not really feeling the V-Day love right now, I made a second version for you. <laughs> and oh wait, for those of you, oh, I got more, those of you who are pre-med and really don't have time for love, you might like this one. <laughs> All right. So. Programming in computer science isn't just about typing cryptic commands like that. It's also about ideas. So some of you have seen this before, but computer science is all about solving problems, solving them efficiently, solving them effectively, solving them cleverly so that you actually get the answer you want quickly. So imagine this, a typical phone book. It literally probably has like a thousand pages. And suppose I want to look up some human. Let's pick a random name, Mike Smith. Right? So somewhere in this phone book is a Mike Smith. How do I, the human, find him? Well, I could, like an idiot, start at the front of the book and start leafing through. And I get to the A's, and I get to the B's, and a 750 pages later, I finally reach the S's, and there is Mike. But I can actually do what you all have already been doing for your lives, probably instinctively, if you even still use a phone book, and you just jump randomly to like the middle. And what's powerful about this is because this device is actually sorted for us in advance. We know the A's are to the left. We know the Z's are to the right. So I can literally realize, oh, I'm on M. I literally can split this problem in two. And now what was a thousand page problem, thank you very much. I practiced in advance. What was actually a thousand page problem is now just 500. I do it again. And now I get to the T's. And I realize, oh, slightly too far. I know Mike's not going to be to the right because he's a Smith. And so now I have. 250 pages, and you can whittle this problem down, again, dividing and conquering again and again until you find that one page where the person you're looking on is on. Now this is powerful. I looked this up earlier today. There's like 47,000 people or more affiliated with the Faculty of Arts and Sciences right now. Faculty, staff, students, and such. If you imagine a hell of a phone book with all of those people in it, you can actually split that thing in half again and again only 15 times until you find the person you're looking for. If, my god, that phone book had 4 billion pages, you know what? You can only split the value 4 billion in half, just as I did by tearing, 32 times. It takes just 32 page tears to whittle through a ridiculous amount of information. And so that's one of the germs of the, an idea that you actually find in this world of 
computer science. So what was it that so turned me on about this particular field? It was that this toy that I had on my desk for writing essays and whatnot, and these days this cell phone I have in my pocket, I can actually tell it to do something that it didn't come designed to do. I don't have to go buy some piece of software off the shelf. I don't have to ask a friend how to do something. I can actually, with just a bit of know-how, the kind of stuff you saw up there, tell this device to do what I want it to do. And the first such program I did was the silly little thing as an undergrad where I, as a freshman, to register for freshman intramural sports, you had to walk sheer across campus to Wigglesworth where Proctor lived. If you wanted to sign up for basketball or whatnot, you write your name on a sheet of paper, slide it under the Proctor's door, and voila, you were registered. So this is like what we call low-hanging fruit. This was a very much a candidate for solving with a website, and thus was born the Frosh IM's website. Well, Shuttleboy was my next sort of project I bit off after taking just one course in this field. And this is a program, if you've never actually seen it, that you pull up a website, shuttleboy.com. You're prompted with an if condition. If the user checks, oh, I don't know, mem hall, and then the user checks, oh, quad, well, here's how you can get out of here in an hour or so time, because this thing updates itself automatically, again, by way of those basic building blocks. And if we have time, actually, for just a little phone call, um, I thought I'd show you one thing that one of CS50's CAs did this past year using this same data set. Uh, admittedly, it's a tad creepy, but uh, here you go. If we can raise the audio. This is CS50 for Shuttleboy. Press 1 to start. What is your origin for quad? Press 1, never. Press 2, Boylston. Press 3, Lamont. Press 4, Mem Hall. Press 5, to start over. The next shuttle leaves this very minute at 9.40 p.m., and then at 9.50 p.m., 9.55 p.m., and 10.10 10 p.m. This is CS50. Anyhow, so that's just... <laughs> That's how I spent my Friday nights. But what's so exciting about being at a place like this is that if you go off on a walk across campus, there are so many inefficiencies around, there are so many opportunities around, so many problems that can be solved with just a modicum of understanding of what it means to control a computer. So the site that you know as Facebook.com grew out of, in part, exactly this reason. Just a few years ago, Harvard College did not have an online Facebook and thus was born a site like that. I dare say some of you are all uh, quite familiar right now uh, with this other website. So up until recently, it was not possible if you saw some hot guy or hot girl on campus <laughs> to let them know that I saw you. <laughs> and thus was born, I saw you harvard.com by one of your own classmates, a senior in Mather House, Tej Tor. And it, what's remarkable about that and what's remarkable about that, and just to dispel one misconception about CS in general, is that it is not filled with the bunch of geeks we thought in high school, all of whom have known programming for many, many years. In fact, in CS50, for instance, this past fall, 72% of the students last fall had no prior programming experience. And Tej was actually in that big blue Pac-Man symbol, 72%. So it is, again, testament to just how much you can do with just a bit of savvy. And so here is the challenge in conclusion. There's a thousand people in this room, and every one of us goes around campus all day and sees things that could be different, sees things that could be better, and sees things that maybe a computer could actually solve than that human. And so what we have decided to set up is this. It's a simple little web page, ideas.cs50.net. You go there, and it just asks you for one thing required an idea. So I would challenge you, if a thousand people in this room can come up with a thousand ideas over the next several weeks, we will pit our army of your classmates next fall on tackling as many of these ideas as possible. See a problem, an efficiency, opportunity on campus that a programmer or website that can solve? Tell us, and we will see what we can do about that. So I think in conclusion, it's a powerful thing that if a thousand of you, my God, submit an idea, that's a whole lot of opportunities. If this is in one ear and out the other, half of you slack off, never actually complete this assignment, that's still 500 marks we can leave on this campus. Heck, if only 10% of, of the people in this room are even paying attention at this point, that's still a hundred differences that we can see on this campus one year hence. So with that said, thank you.